Hello, I'm Rachel Katanak. I'm Fleischmann Hallard's Greater China President, and I'm delighted to facilitate this harassist panel discussion on the topic of whether or not COVID is temporarily hampering innovation in Asia. We have a great lineup of panelists, and I will quickly introduce them and then get straight into the discussion. So first up, uh, Navrup Sadev is the founder and CEO of The Digital Economist. Uh, she's a pioneering economist and technology futurist, and her work lies at the intersection of emerging technologies, economic science, and business strategy. She's currently a Connection Science Fellow at the MIT Media Lab, working to build the future of distributed ledger technologies, digital identity, and digital networks. Tim Kobe is a design leader, founder, and CEO of 8 Inc., sometimes called Apple's best, sec best kept secret. 8 Inc. is one of the most progressive design firms working today. 8 is helping to transform organizations to be relevant in the world's most highly competitive environments by looking at the design factors that drive successful human interaction. David Milroy is currently CEO of Charisme Group, which is investing in new technologies which are being developed to support people as they pivot in their work home environment during and post COVID. Prior to this, he spent 35 years in telecom and technology industries and has spent the last 20 years living in Asia. And Shibu, our Shibu is CEO and founder of Hatch Spaces, as well as a mentor, television panelist, technology enthusiast, and ex naval officer. A naval architect, Shibu was deeply involved in various facets of warship design, build, trials and repairs, and Hatch Spaces has been inspired by the naval way of life and is built to create communities of people with a mission in their lives. So I'm going to address the first question to Nav Navru. Um, is the pandemic temporarily hammering, hampering innovation or is it in fact spurring us on? Yeah, it's, um, I I'm glad you just jumped straight into it, Rachel, because uh, obviously our topic is a statement, which is that COVID is hampering innovation temporarily. And I, I saw you stress the word temporarily, but I actually think the response in Asia has been, uh, perhaps with the exception of India, I think we'll come back to that, um, has been a lot better than a lot of countries in the world, particularly here in the United States. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a road accident. Um, and, and I think a lot of it, obviously, history of um, airborne diseases, uh, particularly in China, Hong Kong. Uh, and, you know, I think there's generally also a lot more awareness around wearing masks, which is not so politicized. Um, as you know, fundamental rights and that being encroached upon, but just a basic hygiene measure uh, that has been around for a number of years. So, uh, you know, what you see now, and uh, you know, um, the Digital Economist has um, uh, its members all over the world, including Singapore. So we hear from colleagues all the time, but a lot of the meetings are kind of back to being in person. And uh, this panel, everyone, I guess, except me, is 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 in Asia. So. Of course, there's a very kind of the hard circuit breakers in Singapore and other countries, but what that actually does is I think it has helped uh, the recovery, the, the path to recovery to be a lot, uh, a lot shorter than uh, many other countries in the world. So if anything, I think uh, the pandemic's gonna actually help bring to fore Asia's leadership in the world and uh, you're starting to see a little bit of a shift when it comes to uh, tackling the societal, the human aspect of, uh, you know, whether it's response to climate change, socioeconomic issues or health issues. I think we're seeing leadership that's emerging from elsewhere. Uh, and it's going to become evident pretty quickly that uh, just transferring money to people's bank accounts is not a sustainable model. David, um, you know, do you agree with that statement? And, and where are we seeing innovation? If you do agree, where, which industries is it most prevalent? Um, I think there's one fundamental that we all have to agree on, and that is that innovation takes investment. And if you're going to invest 
uh, you require a certain amount of confidence that what you're investing in is going to be sustainable and grow. And today, I think there's been a lack of confidence because of the pandemic and other things like that to put sustainable investments in place. Um, if you want to think about, you know, people looking at innovation, uh, the kinds of anything that is now being used as, as companies pivot to allow people to continue to either do their job in the way they did before remotely or, in fact, many new enterprises are being born as a result of the, as a result of the pandemic. So I think that anything that allows people to operate remotely will benefit. Technologies will grow. Um, we're now talking as we are online. That didn't happen last year. I think there's been probably five years of technological innovations happened in the last five months. We've accelerated the growth of all these future plans we all had. So we're now able to work remotely. So the kinds of industries that are benefiting apart from obviously the home deliveries like Amazon, where everybody is getting you know, stuff brought to their house, working from home. So anybody that's using a platform to allow people to collaborate, anything that's allowing people to continue to do their job remotely will find growth in this new market. The ones that will suffer are the ones that have to rely on face-to-face -face interaction. So the services industry. Uh, if you think about anything that involves people interacting, whether it's, you know, in hospitality or it's in uh, entertainment or things like that. So that's going to always be the ones that suffer. So I see the main innovation will happen to continue to, uh, for, to allow some form of normalcy in our current, in current work environment. We're never going back to 2019 again. We just have to adapt to where we are now. Okay. So, Tim, you've heard David talk about, you know, five years of technology development in, in five months. Are you seeing that sort of innovation in the design field and are brands, your clients, taking risks? Um, are they wanting innovative thinking or are, in fact, they playing it safe? Well, I think, you know, the, the acceleration that, that, you know, everybody is talking about, that acceleration has actually created um, for, I think, probably the most aware or most successful companies that we work with has created some opportunity. And so the idea that the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial opportunities have been hampered by COVID, um, it may have, have actually uh, been an impetus for some fundamental changes. And I think one of the biggest changes is, is in the mindset. Uh, Asia has historically not had uh, the position of necessarily taking the lead. I think what's happened now with successful, relatively successful management of, of COVID, um, they're thrust into an opportunity to maybe lead out of this situation. And it may not be the most comfortable situation, but I think it is an opportunity. Um, and the companies that, that we work with have seen uh, points where, you know, COVID and, and everything that people have gone through have essentially um, expanded, accelerated uh, the changes that were in sectors that were in trouble already. So the ones that were in trouble fundamentally have, got, have gotten in deeper trouble much quicker. And, and so what that means is people have to start thinking about uh, what do we do in this, this time of change? And because of the frequency, the rate of change has increased. What's interesting, I, I think, is, um, you know, that there's as much risk associated with trying new things as there is with staying with the status quo. The status quo is actually equally, if not greater, uh, risk today. And so um, it's sort of pushing uh, Asia to the forefront in the sense that, that we now have economies that are relatively functional uh, today because of, of some, you know, uh, uh, some of the lockdown measures that were, that were mentioned earlier. But I, I think it's, it's a great opportunity for the region. And um, it does mean a mind shift, a mindset uh, change. Um, and I don't know, somebody said never let a good crisis go to waste. This is sort of the, the same idea. Yeah. Definitely an economist there, Tim. Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, um, Shivu, um, you know, innovation can be used for good or for, for bad. And I guess the question is, 
India perhaps is still in lockdown and is, is, you know, there's a whole underserved population in India who have been dreadfully impacted by the severe and sudden lockdown. Um, are you seeing examples of where innovation is actually being used to address some of these inequalities um, as a result of COVID in India? That, that's a good question, Rachel. Uh, so I think some of the uh, sectors that have got impacted, I think uh, David's brought out. So on the uh, on the sectors where people can work from home, they have maybe grown, but there are service sectors where there are human inter human interactions. So those those are the things which have really got affected in a very bad way. So in India, if you see, there are uh, various innovations which are being driven to uh, you know, uh, adjust and adopt to this new world. Uh, fortunately, in India, the penetration of mobile network and the 4G network is, is, is growing at a very, very, very rapid pace. Uh, for example, uh, if you see the fishermen, actually, how, how, they, uh, how they sell the fishes along the coast. Uh, earlier, what they used to do, they used to come alongside and then there used to be a bigger trader who used to take it off. And then he used to auction those fishes off to, you know, various people who would eventually buy it, maybe factories or individuals or subsequent traders. Uh, now, what is happening is that most of the trade happens at sea itself and they use the, uh, uh, as soon as they come within range where uh, they are able to transmit on the mobile networks, they actually start the auction process. I'm not talking about the bigger trawlers or the bigger mm -hmm. vessels. I'm talking about the really small fishermen. You know, the guys with two or three guys in a boat who go out and do some fishing along the coastal zones. So the, the trade is done before they actually uh, touch the shore. So that, that to me, uh, brings freshness onto the plate of uh, the person who is a consumer eventually, who is going to pay for it. The fisherman benefits because he gets a larger chunk of uh, the revenue for actually the sale. So those are those are innovations which are constantly happening and and some of the innovations have got accelerated like uh, tim bought out so those those small elements of uh, accelerations are happening at uh, you know various places for example uh, the way we shop from a vegetable shop in india typically it's not supermarkets but you buy stuff from say kirana stores they're called kirana stores they're really small stores you know where you can uh, maybe one man one man at the billing desk, he's managing the full shop and you go and pick up whatever you want to. So now uh, what is done in the post-COVID world is that we can access those smaller shops through technology. So the uh, even that person can sell a very, very small commodity item to a nearby area. So you, you, we're not talking necessarily the big boys like the Zomato or the Swiggy or some of the other guys, even these people have connected on WhatsApp and phone calls. So if you are living close by, you can really pick up stuff. So if you maybe if it's just a packet of wafer chips, you know, as simple as that, you just give a call and the thing is there at your home. So those are those are the innovations which are, you know, continuously happening on the uh, ground level. So, so I think I, I just give you the bottom line, Rachel. So I mean, the, the big, big, bigger picture. I think many people cover it. So I thought I, yes. I just give you the bottom. Line. Those grassroots. Yes. Uh, yes. Just, I was just going to. Kind of dovetailing with that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, you know, uh, born and raised in India, so I feel I feel like I should weigh in here. Um, uh, yeah, Shibu. I think that's that's exciting. That's encouraging. But I also think at the same time, uh, just kind of. I guess setting the stage here, India is worst hit, economically speaking, of all of the countries in the world due to COVID. Uh, it saw uh, over 7% of its GDP contract, uh, which is massive. It doesn't have the sort of financial instruments to transfer uh, cash into citizens' hands. Uh, there is no such thing as social security. There is no such thing as uh, Medicare for all or any of those things. So, you know, it's nice that we could talk about a few little things here and there, but I think what we're looking at is a, is a massive shock to the economy and just a very irresponsible without kind of getting into the politics of it, policymaking. Um, 
you know, as an economist, uh, 15 years, something that they teach us in schools, and that's obvious too, is that you slowly tweak things and you build the ground and then you change things because behavioral change in humans is the hardest thing in the world. But, you know, what you see is the shock therapy that we see over and over again, whether it's through demonetization or very hard curfews, you saw a massive movement of day laborers on foot. Like, and I think those, those are important things to discuss here when you're talking about the response to COVID in Asia, right? Where uh, with kids a few months old, they're walking in like heat back to the villages hundreds of miles away. Um, and, and so, you know, that's kind of what we're comparing to. Of course, Singapore is a, is a, is a very different um, economy compared to what we're talking about here. So sure, for innovation and, of course, in order to survive, you could take, you know, for example, you talk about Shibu, if it's a local grocery or convenience store, take the orders on the phone or something. But then I think um, what we're looking at is a, is a, is a big tragedy, if, if anything, um, you know, uh, when it comes to response to, to COVID or what COVID has done, uh, particularly to India, which I think kind of stands out within the, the larger Asian landscape, kind of what I was referring to in, in the beginning. Okay. David, this brings me on to the point that you made right at the beginning, and, and that's about um, innovation needs investment. And I guess, you know, are people investing in the right things in terms of innovation and are the right parties coming together in terms of government and NGO, civil society, together with the private sector to create the right platforms so that innovation is is happening in the right place and um, getting to the right people? Or is that putting constraints around innovation that are in fact not possible at this time? Yeah, Rachel, I think I think one of the things that's going to happen as a result of this is almost a two-step process. The immediate response of the governments is to try and provide innovation, sorry, support um, and other kinds of grants, things like that. But there's going to have to be a reallocation of capital. And what I mean by that is the reallocation of capital is a shift from a responsive allocation to a permanent allocation. So whilst right now we're all reactive to trying to keep businesses afloat or people fed or dealing with the humanitarian issue of what's going on, we're going to have to think about the reallocation of capital to more structural solutions. And that's where the issue of innovation comes in because that's going to take money, that's going to take capital, it's going to take trust as well. And trust is something which people still have to get back. There's been a breach of trust in the past years that I think people are also worried, you know, they're not going to get looked after, things like that. Uh, I want to pick up on something that Tim said as well. And, Tim, you said that um, a lot of the decisions about as companies are growing, uh, the COVID has shown those that can survive to survive. I think what we're facing is, uh, taking an economist's point of view, almost a K-curve. The strong will get stronger, but mm. what COVID has done is force those that were weak, unfortunately, to fail faster than they may have if, yeah. there, if there wasn't this pandemic. So I think the, the two things are the reallocation of capital is a point I'm making, and COVID has accelerated a K-curve where the strong are surviving and the weak are failing. Yeah. I, and and just maybe on I'll, that, I'll just, David, re- just, to, just get Tim to comment and then never it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I think in your your point about reallocation of capital, um, a part of that is reallocation of of creative capital. In other words, the, when you say strong or weak, what we're looking at are the people who are creating value turn out to be stronger, and the ones who are extracting value or, in worst case, destroying value are are weaker in many cases. Very true. Very and true. I think I think that that's where your the distribution of your intellectual capital is just as important as your money. And the idea that that we are starting to refocus the, the nature of the problem around the human outcome. If we're not designing for human outcomes, it's harder to create value. We can extract value from static systems or or slowly moving systems very easily, and that's that's been uh, a big part historically. But I think today, more and more people have to look at what actually creates value, and then what does value mean? 
And, you know, I think if you look at human outcome as the objective of, of, of that, um, you start to maybe reframe what are business opportunities, uh, what are the uh, systems that will support that. And it, it ultimately, it has to do with transforming the way you think about, about the world. I mean, in a way, we've been, we've been looking at a, you know, fragmented system, something that's been linear, uh, objective oriented. We, we, we've been sort of living in a DOS world and it's time, it's time for a new operating system. Yeah, this is almost like a forced inflection point we're in right now. That's right. That's right. Okay. I think so. Never right, right. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be speaking right after Tim here. Um, uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Tim. Um, yeah. point on in terms of bringing that human centered piece to the fore. And I think that pandemic is forcing that. Uh, one point that uh, David, I wanted to make right after you around the allocation of capital is that that is our desire, but what we've seen, just kind of bringing a data point here, is every billionaire in the world pretty much has added a billion dollars uh, to their to their wealth since the pandemic, um, particularly the tech companies, right? So what we're seeing is a uh, the goal that is a human centered outcomes is not going to get achieved automatically. Uh, so that is kind of the, 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 the takeaway, right? Back in March, we were talking about and trying to figure out which industries would be most impacted, which ones would grow. Sure, uh, things and systems need to be resilient. We get it. We started running a, um, a working group series on anti-fragile. How do you actually build systems that grow when there are stresses rather than just stay the same, uh, resilient or robust, right? And, and I think... But that is where what you talked about, Tim, and also the mission of the Digital Economist, the, the organization I run, is to move towards those, to build those systems, get that mind shift. But I think my question also uh, to everybody here and also the audience is to think about uh, what it's going to take. What is the how of it? We get the why, we get the what, but what is the how of it? And that's kind of where, um, and, and what are we doing about it, right? Shibu, um, any comments on what, what the other speakers have just said? And, and I'd also like to talk to you a little bit about the cultural environment of innovation and particularly in, in light of your own business, which is about working spaces, which bring people together and the importance of um, new ways of interacting potentially to create innovation. You know, how, how what are we looking at in terms of, new ways of collaborating uh, to create innovation. Yeah, Rishal, in the, in the first part, yeah, I do agree with David that the capital really has to go in, in the right places, but which is the right place is the big question. So now coming to actually uh, remote working and in the new world, uh, if you split the issue into four, particularly on a work from home front, the first part is about implementation, you know, we got that right. We got we we you know pivoted quickly to reach that point. Everybody did because the internet penetration was there and it allowed people to you know kind of pivot quickly and get the implementation part done. The second part is the technological part of securing the infrastructure with a lot of confidential data is going on on those channels. So I'm not going into it. Uh, the third one is about the work life balance. Suddenly work is you know gone. What, what was our earlier work-life balance has gone out of the window. You know, everybody sitting at home. Uh, mm -hmm. The husbands are seeing too much of their wives and the wives are seeing too much of the husband and the kids are seeing both of them. And so it's created a kind of a pandemic. pandemic. <laughs> uh, so the, and, and the most critical part is that the line uh, where you draw the line, when the working hour ends and when the working hour starts, that's gone out of the window. There is no Saturday, Sundays. There is no Monday to Friday. Uh, the last and the most critical part, which we spoke about, was the cultural transition, actually. When we actually transition to this uh, this new world, uh, for example, we are all meeting on, uh, the, uh, on, on an online mode. We are not being able to see or feel each other in a, in a real uh, situation where we would have discussed those points. So uh, for existing people you can transition those cultural values but for uh, new people how do you transition and at the heart of uh, innovation lies actually uh, cultural understandings 
you know there has to be some common points there has to be uh, the the common point need not be the same business it can be some other business but uh, there may be a common point in terms of an interest in terms of a passion in terms of trying to find a solution to a common problem uh in in our workplaces we could have uh, people from diverse backgrounds coming and uh, you know meeting up and talking during their uh, off hours and then discovering that they have a common passion uh discovering that there is something they they can resolve together there is a problem that they can uh, attack together and then they can bring a mission uh, and a value back into their own lives by doing those things uh in the new world how do you do that i mean there are various forums where you can get together and discuss all those things but without the human element how much of innovation can you do so if you take the objective part out yes on objectively we have innovated uh, multiple times on uh, how to work what to do what not to do but on um certain subjective terms how 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 do you do so that that's that's a big question i mean uh, it it is a very critical question and uh, in the future when ai is going to take away a lot of those jobs this is critical that the human element is not missed out the human mm-hmm. emotion is not missed out when uh, you know ai takes off those jobs we we cannot forget uh, the larger chunk of the human population um tim your perspective on on that the, the criticalness of the human element and how do you incorporate that into design thinking and and your work well yeah i think i you know i mentioned the the focus uh really in in the work that we that we undertake is what are the human outcomes we're creating um whether that's uh you know a big corporation or or a small project um you ultimately have to be looking at making things that other people think are valuable and that means you have to create something that's meaningful for them um i think that's ultimately the foundation of any any good design and i think there's there's probably some design that's progressive and some that's maybe regressive um and again it goes back to whether you're creating value or not but i guess you know when you when you approach design as a way of of um you know improving things at least the objective of the 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 criteria for the for the design is is in the right place um many of the companies that we would talk to would say well you know we we want to make money our our job as a business is to make money and the best way we've seen for companies to make money is to design things that that people want and so when you start to look at that um it it gets i think the alignment of the human outcome in line with the business outcomes we've seen the most value creation happen when you do that and we've seen ones who tend to do more value extraction kinds of strategies have maybe maybe short term successes but ultimately uh you know are in a panic not long after that because they really haven't been been focused on creating value so i think i think you know with any with any design you look at you look at what are the human outcomes what's the strategy that delivers those outcomes and then what are the tactics that deliver on the strategy to deliver the outcome so it's sort of a sort of a ladder of the ladder uh the group you know talking of human centered outcomes and and you're an economist but do you think the private sector and government really understand the changed consumer as a result of covid do you think they really understand what consumers want or need and therefore are investing um in the right way that is going to get the innovation outcomes that are necessary for economies to rebound. Yeah, oof, big question. Um where do I start, right? Um you know, a couple of uh, I guess quick uh, definition things. We all are consumers, right? There's no such thing as government versus producer versus consumers. Hum- uh, economists just use that as a way to model the economy, which by the way by now is useless because there's so much uh, uncertainty and randomness and complexity that just you really can't make accurate predictions so we move to models that are a lot more computational uh and complex uh particularly the complex system science uh that's it's a lot lot better than regression models traditionally used um so that's one bucket the other bucket is um whether 
or not, uh, they understand it. I think the short answer is no, they don't quite. But then, then again, since everything is interrelated, do consumers understand what they want? Talking about Apple, the most famous, I think, statement in the entrepreneurial world is by Steve Jobs, show people, you know, what they want. Like you, you dictate as an entrepreneur, and that's, I think, the beauty of entrepreneurship too, where you can tangibly move the needle. You can change behavior through products, through leadership, uh, right? And 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 how you deliver that value in the world. So it's, I don't believe it's all about reverse engineering from what the consumer quote unquote wants. Um, and and I think case in point is the uh, the massive social media experiment that's happening in the world, uh, aka Facebook, right? And something like that at a global scale that hasn't happened before uh, has consequences. What we call path dependent which is that there would always be history in the system, right? And, and like, like um, you know, the other speakers here talked about, this is an inflection point. And in, in fact, it's a crisis that defined the trajectory more than anything else. Um, in, um, from, a, from a macroeconomic standpoint, um, coming back to the question of, okay, so let's say we all agree that human-centered outcomes is what we are after. Right. So then the question is, what are the instruments at our disposal? Right. There's just government instruments, fiscal monetary policy. There is consumer awareness, uh, advocacy, uh, nonprofit, civil society organizations and all of that. Right. So they work in, a, in, in tandem where one stresses the other. But we also see in the world that's in jeopardy where the right wing is, uh, you know, you know, luckily it's OK, relatively OK in the U.S. now. But <laughs> Uh, but we've seen a lot of damage uh, in the past, and uh, it's still happening, right? Uh, India is a great case in point uh, where there's a, a leadership uh, gap where you don't see uh, the best talent, uh, you know, staying and being part of that system and wanting to reform it. You see them leaving uh, because there is uh, so much entrenched interest um, in the system. And so I think the question really is, in my mind, like, how do you break free? And my answer to that is through entrepreneurship um, and more than anything through female entrepreneurship, because you're looking at a reservoir of trillions of dollars of GDP uh, if women contribute uh, to the world, um, world economy at the same level that uh, currently men are, right? And, and so there you have the... the you know, starting point of the answer. If you want to build an economy that is human centered, that is empathy focused, right? Um, from, a, from a social conditioning point of view, uh, women have much higher empathy than men. We did this experiment at MIT, which is a randomized controlled experiment. And so we basically put these small devices as necklaces in people's necks. Uh, and walk around the correct micro data on it, right? And this big data is usually one or two soccer fields, and that's fairly small for us in terms of the data set size. And so then, you know, we found out that if you want to build uh, the most effective teams, the most high empathy teams, the fastest way to do that is have at least 50% women. The way IQ is measured, effectiveness is measured in a team is very different from, you know, the way uh, individual IQ is measured. So um, I think the more, and that kind of brings me back to our topic here around uh, COVID hampering innovation. And I think it's been doing circles that states that are led to governments that are led by um, a female, uh, you know, mm. and not to say that we don't like men, of course, you know, we like men as well. <laughs> Um, but they've been been faring a lot better in the, the way of handling the crisis because I think the writing's on the wall that human outcomes uh, to everyone's point here is uh, point here is what we are after and we need to integrate empathy into everything we do. Like design thinking changed my life uh, a couple of years ago when I started working with designers. Um, and you always kind of have it, but you know the way design brings it to the fore. It's, it's just mind blowing. I personally think economists and designers need to, you know, talk a lot more and, and bring that understanding of the socioeconomic machinery, how money is created, how value is created, how it's perpetuated, how all value is perception, right? A glass of water right now may not have any value to you, but if you're dying in a desert, that glass of water is worth anything under the planet. 
So all value is perceived value, um, right, in the world. There's no such thing as intrinsic value. Um, so all of these questions, I think, bringing those to the fore, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, I'm glad to say we're pursuing a lot of that through the ecosystem that we're nurturing. And, uh, and I think through this panel, what we're seeing here is uh, that consensus is building rapidly that these are the outcomes that, that we are after. So our, yeah, I guess uh, the hashtag here is radical collaboration. Uh, and that's also what, you know, we need to rally governments for, uh, organizations like the UN, World Economic Forum and others who are also taking the lead and rallying the industry to bring those to the fore. Do they have all the pieces right now? The answer is no, they don't. Technology is mm -hmm. way ahead of what governments currently know and can deal with. Mm -hmm. Long answer David. to your question, Rachel. <laughs> That's good. I, I especially like the bit about, um, and I'm not biased here, of course, um, about female leaders operating countries. We're originally from New Zealand, so that strikes a chord with me. Um, but, <laughs> but David, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Naruk talked about was um, talent and talent being in the right place and, and of course, the role of women in, in entrepreneurship. And, you know, I know one of the things that you've thought about is, is you know, the, the expat brains trust and the impact of people leaving Asia um, on, on innovation and whether, in fact, we do have the right talent in the right place um, and are nurturing the right talent uh, for, for innovation. Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of, of things to, to break down that question. I think if you look back over the last 20 years, historically Asia was a, a, a very attractive place for a lot of the expats to come and live, as Tim and I are. I've been here for 20 years. Um, and, and, and we, we as expats were attracted here by the companies or placed here because we were perceived to bring a certain amount of knowledge or experience or some background to a place called Asia that theoretically didn't have that. Now, if you fast forward to today, I would argue that that knowledge exists here both organically and through education and through osmosis and people living here and there is no difference. What I found interesting, if we look at the topic of the conversation, COVID is hampering Asian innovation, I'd probably argue that, in fact, this pandemic has caused us to communicate more than we did previously. I'll give you a working example. A good friend of mine is CEO of a, a large company, software company based in the US, and their head office is in Hong Kong in Asia. And the, the, the C-suite, the, the senior executives, would probably meet maybe once every two weeks at most, often once a month. And if not, they were on a plane going to the US or Japan or Australia or everywhere. So when you went into the head office in Hong Kong, most often there would only be one or two of the senior management sitting there. He's explained to me that since COVID, He's actually seen more of the management team now online virtually than he has over the past five years because they're seeing each other every week or every few days because it's so much easier to be able to interact as we are today. So I'd say, in fact, there has been an innovation where this COVID has accelerated our ability to communicate. That means that the brain trust, which was originally this sacred thing of people coming from the US or the UK or to Hong Kong or to Singapore has, has effectively gone. And uh, what I have seen is a number of families have chosen to go back to their home countries, their birthplace or repatriate home, and, and they're still working virtually. So it, it hasn't really affected the brain trust, but in a physical sense, we're now accelerating. We're now actually able to communicate better so I'd say there's two sides to the same thing. Physically, we've been dislocated, but um, from a business point of view, we've probably been more efficient. Okay. I'd like and, to ask, oh, Tim, go for it. No, I was, I was just going to add a comment to that because I think, you know, the idea of how innovation is occurring today, and, and it, was, it was brought up, you know, through a number of points, um, we're seeing innovation in companies, innovations in the way we work together, innovations in the way we communicate, but we're not really seeing innovation in government. So if you think of the laggard, and most governments today are struggling because they're unable to keep up with change. They're not designed for change. 
And yeah. one of the most one of the most interesting design problems that someone uh, approached me with recently was: Have we ever thought about designing a government? And it was the premise that if you took everything you knew about all other forms of government and learned from that, if you were to start from scratch, what, how would it how would it look? What would you do? What would you base it on? And I think it's a fascinating premise because when you when you, when you think about when you think about governments, most of them, even Singapore, uh, is what fifty years old. It's, it's probably one of the newer countries. Um, but many of the systems that are in place today have a lot of legacy and are basically encumbered by a lot of legacy thinking. So if you're looking at innovation and you're, you're investing in every other possible form of innovation in, in, in humanity, uh, my question is, why aren't we looking at it from a, from a governmental standpoint and starting to recognize that maybe the sources for income have changed? You know, if we're looking at human outcomes as the fundamental benefit, um, the way we tax, the way we represent, the fairness, the equity between men and women, between between uh, different cultures and religions, etc. You know, all of those things are potentially on the table, and I think that 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 that's a, a pretty interesting uh, uh, way to think about innovation. Is are we innovating enough at a level that represents the way in, the ways in which we we are successful or not together? And and certainly COVID has taught us that uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. So, so I'm going to do a quick round robin uh, last question for everyone um, and just answer in a couple of words because we've got literally two minutes 36 seconds left and so the question is are you optimistic about the future of innovation in, in Asia and do you think it's going to be Asia's century and Shibu I'll start with you. Rachel I'm an eternal optimist I always see optimism so even when we were uh, speaking of the governments I was seeing the positive side of how things have rolled out for example in India uh, the there are various ration shops, you know, where you give out food to uh, various people. So these are going at either at subsidized rates or they go at free of cost to people below the poverty line. Uh, so since these uh, channels were already in place, uh, nobody died of hunger during COVID. That's that's you know, that's an amazing statement to make. That's that's not a small achievement. It's it's a massive achievement. Yeah. Uh, secondly, also the tax structures are, uh, most of the tax structures have gone online to the financial systems and how the fintech is advanced across the world. So you would see that uh, benefits would be uh, given directly to the uh, endpoints without having somebody in the middle. So this has happened all across the world in various forms. Maybe it's in, in terms of a tax waiver, in terms of giving direct benefits. So those are all things possible due to where we are today in terms of technology, right? So moving forward, I'm sure I am an eternal optimist. I see a better world. I see things improving. There'll be a lot of innovations and uh, it, it will it will uh, be uh, better. I mean, this will teach us and make us better. Okay. Navroop, yes or no? Optimist or not? Yes. And one thing I'll quote is James Baldwin who said, uh, I'm an optimist because I'm alive. That's a good one. Tim. Uh, yeah, I'm an optimist. Um, I think in terms of your question about Asia, you know, um, something like 5 billion of the 7 billion people on the planet are within an eight hour flight from Singapore and the majority of them are under 30. So, uh, you know, the, the, this has to be the place for change. David. Uh, I'm in violent agreement. That's all. <laughs> okay. Fabulous. Well, thank you very, very much for your contributions. I think we've had a great discussion today and reached consensus on a number of things. I think that um, the whole uh, question that you posed, Tim, about should we be re redesigning government is a, a very, very interesting one for us all to consider. And I'm glad we had total consensus on optimism for uh, Asia's innovation in, in the time to come. Thank you all very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to you, Rachel. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.